Once you've registered at the registration desk, you would have left your email. We do have an e-copy of the program that was sent to you. So if you want to get more information about the presenters, more information about the conference, and more about the topics, please feel free to check your emails and you will have access to that information. Our third panel is titled Music Literacy as a Professional Tool. First, we will have Ms. Josan Francis, who will present her topic titled Beyond the Stage. Secondly, we'll have Mr. Marcus Ash, Professionalism Behind the Curtain. And our third presentation on this panel will be done by the National Steel Symphony Orchestra. When all of the presentations are over for this panel, we will have a short question and answer. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Josan Francis. A pleasant good afternoon, everyone. I am Josanne Francis. I was born and raised right here in this beautiful Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. After secondary school, I left Trinidad and went to the United States where I pursued a bachelor's degree in music education at the University of Southern Mississippi, following which I did a master's in music, steel pan performance at the Northern Illinois University. Currently, I reside in the States where I work 100% for myself as a self-employed professional musician and music educator. I serve as the artistic director of what I would regard as one of the best arts in, arts in education programs in the United States. I'm referring to the Cultural Academy for Excellence. Over the years of working as a performer and educator, I was able to learn and develop some skills that were necessary to making me successful and making me remain successful as a self-employed musician and educator. I learned this through trial and error, from observing others in the craft, and just by simply asking questions. In this presentation, I will be touching on some of the tools that I believe are very integral for one's success as a, perfor a performing musician or artist. This is not a comprehensive list, and in the interest of time, I've selected five main areas that I will address. These include professionalism as a lifestyle, separation of business and personal, managing oneself, collaboration, and remaining relevant. Professionalism as a lifestyle. So one of the main differences between being a professional musician and other jobs is that in the other regular job, you report, you execute your duties, you show up at the work site, execute your duties, you leave and go about your personal business. However, it's not the same as a professional musician. Whether you are on the stage or off the stage, people see you as the artist. It doesn't matter if you wear a costume on stage or not. When you're off stage, people don't see the person, they see the artist. So the first point under this area of professionalism as a lifestyle I would like to talk about is branding. So by definition, Branding is the promotion of a particular product or company by means of advertising and distinctive design. So as an artist, what is your brand? Your branding includes your personality on the stage, how you're dressed, your artistic choices, how you speak on stage, the ways that you choose to express your art and yourself while you are on the stage. Finding and developing your brand may take time and it will always be 
a work in progress because things are always changing in the environment. But once you find your brand, you yourself need to respect it. And this is very important because if you don't respect your brand, you cannot expect anybody else to respect your brand. So how do you respect and maintain your brand even when you are off the stage? And how does this work in adopting this professionalism as a lifestyle? What do you do off the stage? How do you dress when you're off the stage? People would see you at the grocery store. They will see you if you go to the bar and have some drinks with your friends. You want to maintain that professionalism even in your personal life. The second point under there is discipline. I know we have a few um, students. Are there any students? Raise your hand if you're a student. Okay, so while you're in school, you have this comfort and safety of having your professors. They help you through development of your craft. They help you select pieces that you'll perform. They make it required that you practice. They help you set deadlines. But once you leave school, you don't have your professor right there. Yes, they will be there as your mentor. You can reach out to them. But they have new students that they'll be working with. So this discipline that you would have developed as a student in the school, you need to take it out into your professional life. Because nobody is going to be there to say, OK, Josan, time to practice. OK, Josan, time to send this email. OK, Josan, do this or do that. So you, as the business owner of yourself, need to be disciplined enough to set those deadlines. And I attended um, Liam T's presentation yesterday. And one of the best things, he said so many great things, but one of the things that really stood out and I hope stuck with the students is practice smarter, not harder. I'll say that again. Practice smarter, not harder. As you get older and you get into the professional field, you will have a lot more responsibilities. So by being disciplined, you will know what you need to do, when you need to do it, and how you need to do it in order to achieve whatever your goal is so that you can become and remain a successful professional musician. Next, communication and interpersonal skills. As a professional musician now, everybody I meet, I see as, okay, how can I use that person? Everybody you meet can be a very, very important part of your career as a professional musician. For example, if you attend a show and you know the person who is the headliner, at the end of the show, you go up to that person, you interact with them, tell them how much you enjoyed the show, Pick something that really, really stood out to you and let that person know. They will remember that. And if they get hired or called to do a gig in the future and they cannot do it, they will remember the good things that you said to them and they might consider passing that on to you. In addition to that, the persons that might be performing with them on the stage, interact with them as well. You may not know them, but get to know them because they can be an asset to you in the future in a performance or a concert or whatever have you. Also, the importance of follow up. You meet somebody, they give you their information, and sometimes that's it. That's never the end. That's never the end. So if you are trying to get more performances, more gigs at festivals or at a very popular concert hall, and you come in contact with someone who is in a position of decision making at the venue or at the festival, you may want to reach out to them to see if you can bring your craft and your product to their, their hall, their festival. So a lot of times festivals book way, way in advance. So communicating with them there and then may not result in something right there and right then. But that's why we have follow up. So every now and then, send an email. If you're doing a show, send someone an email saying, hey, I'm doing this show, so-and-so. I can reserve two tickets for you at the door. 
I would like you to come and check it out. Even if you're not having a show, send an email with a recording of yourself saying, hey, check this out. I think this will be a great, a great addition to your festival or something that you can think about for the future. And I have done this before. And for example, I met someone who works with the Jazz at Lincoln Center. And we had an interaction at an event that I did not perform at, but I introduced myself to them. They exchanged their contact information with me. I sent a follow-up email. Hey, it was great meeting you. I love the work you're doing. In that email, I didn't say, hire me. I'm just establishing communication so that we can start some type of relationship going. A couple months down the road, I did a show and I recorded it. Sent the video over saying, hey, check this out. This is a new ensemble that I put together. We are doing this, we are doing that. Let me know if you think it'll be a great addition or how I can tweak it to be a great addition to your programming. Three months later, she reached out to me and hired me to come out to New York and do a show. A few months later after that, she reached out to me again to do another performance abroad that I unfortunately couldn't do because I had another engagement. But it is very, very important that you follow up and see everybody as a very important part in advancing your career in some way or the other. And they don't have to be in the field of music. It doesn't have to be in the field of music. There's so many other fields that are very important that you can collaborate with, and I will talk about that a little bit later as well. So you really just want to remain in their radar without being annoying. Because what you do not want is that email saying, hey, please stop emailing me. Or hey, please don't call here anymore. And you don't want them to block you. So knowing when to push yourself, be pushy to promote yourself, promote your brand, but not be annoying because you do not want to push somebody away. And the last thing in here is something that we really shouldn't have to talk about, conduct, but it's very simple. The way you conduct yourself off the stage can heavily impact your presence on the stage. It can affect whether someone decides to hire you or not. Because people talk, people talk. And I am at a point in my life right now where my peers, when I was young and growing up, are now in positions of making decisions. And they now have students of their own. Mr. Kualit, Marcus Ash, Mia Gormandy. So if someone is trying to do something, come to the United States, and they are maybe talking to the ambassador, the Trinidad and Tobago ambassador to the United States. He is going to call me and say, hey, Joe Zan, so-and-so wants to come and do this, da 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 I said, oh, okay, where did they go to school? Who did they study with? I'll make a few calls. And to be completely honest, I have gotten a call or a couple calls before, and when I communicate with their teacher, who I'm very close with, some of the things that I heard made me say, no, this is not a good idea. So the way you conduct yourself outside, beyond the stage, and even in your classroom now can heavily impact you in the future. And also, nobody wants to hire somebody who is not nice. The separation of business and personal. So as a professional self-employed musician, it is very, very hard to dis just draw a clear, solid line to distinguish for yourself and for others, business, personal. Josan, the musician, Josan, the educator, and just Josan Francis. Because at the end of the day, we are all humans. So we need to know when to make that this, um, to distinguish what is business and what is personal. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit quicker because I'm getting a three minute warning. So communication. Whenever someone needs to reach out to me to do a performance, my email is management at josanfrancis.com. Management at josanfrancis.com. Not josan.francis at gmail.com or josandipangil at gmail.com. And I can tell you what this does. Two things. One, it helps separate what is business and personal. I don't have any Facebook emails coming in today 
I don't have anybody trying to sell me something coming in there. Everything that comes in there is just personal. And also, if you're trying to apply to perform or get a, a show at a big venue or a festival, the festival producer is going to see management. Oh, she has a great management team. She is very organized. I don't have to worry about communication or anything. But guess who is managing my management email address? Me. All right? So it works good in two ways. Social media, creating a separate account for your personal stuff as well as your, your music stuff. Business name and financial accounting. So nobody ever writes a check to Josanne Francis. I have two businesses. I have Josanne Francis LLC, which is my performing business, and I have Steel on Wheels LLC, which is my education business. If anyone wants to hire me for a performance, they go through Josanne Francis LLC. If anyone wants to hire me to do a presentation or some teaching or the other, they go through Steel on Wheels LLC. When that check comes in, it goes into those business accounts. I have three separate accounts. I have an account for education, I have an account for performing, and I have my personal account. When that check goes in, I then pay myself. And I never pay myself the full amount of what was paid to the business. Because at the end of the day, I want my business to grow. And when it comes time to buy new instruments, or buy some type of equipment, or buy a plane ticket to go and do a presentation or something, I don't have to dig into my personal funds. It is already there as a business expense, and at the end of the year, I can write it off as a business expense for tax purposes. And I'm getting to stop, but I'm just gonna go through quickly, just to read. Um, for managing oneself, of course, you wanna have great planning and managing for your time, having contracts. I don't do anything without a contract. Um, EPK and electronic press kit, it is free to create on Adobe Spark. And there's that following up again. I will just share one experience I had at a performance. Uh, the contract said, one part of the contract, there was venue requirements. The performance area should be free and clear of obstacles and should offer reasonable protection from weather elements, including rain and direct sunlight or excessive heat. In the event that these conditions are not met and there is a substantial risk to the performer or damage to the instruments, the performer reserves the right to refuse services and still get paid. And there was a day I did a performance. It was 106 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is about 41 degrees Celsius. And the event manager did not make any accommodations for this. So I refused to perform outside. We made some accommodations. I did a performance inside and was still able to make it work. So know your worth. Protect yourself with contracts. And one last thing, collaborate with people and it'll all be good. So this is my contact information management at josanfrancis.com. Please feel free to reach out to me. I am very willing to share this presentation. I know I got through some stuff really, really quickly, but you can reach out to me, management at josanfrancis.com. And I can also share with you my contract. You can use it as a template for yourself for, for the future. And I thank you very much for having me today, and I'll be open to questions afterwards. Thank you. Pleasant afternoon to everybody. Before I start, let me just take this time to really congratulate Mark Loquan on this very major accomplishment of 20 years. I really think that you deserve a round of applause again. And I shall begin now. I know there is a Nicholas Joseph in front waiting to pull me off with a hook if I run over my time. So my name is Marcus Ash, and I will tell you a little about myself, which would lead into my presentation today behind the curtain. Um, on the 5th of March 2002, I lost a bet. 
And that's how I began my music journey that got me here. I was required to do a music class for one month. And that one month turned into six months, Southeast, UWE, Lady and Steel, the NSSO for 10 years and 10 days. And I got to a point where I went through all what Josan would have been saying, all what all the other presenters would have been teaching about this morning. We would have done all the music literacy classes. I would have learned. I could sight read like a whiz. I'm playing good. I in Silver Stars are doing well. I joined the NSSO. Everything is going fine. And one day I had enough of steel pan music and anything cultural. And I rapped. Close up shop. That's a wrap. And I said, I'm retired from music and this arts and culture and everything, and I am gone. Enough is enough. Because after being a professional for some years, you wait for it to be reciprocated to you, and you remain there waiting. And there are many people here who can testify to that today. There are many. And you wonder, where are you going with this? When I realized I was reaching a point of frustration, it would have been around 2014, I would have opened a business because my first field of study was marketing. Music was second. And I said, I'm going to open this company and do marketing and advertising. And it started to be, I said, all right, we open the next one. I got some friends involved. We open a tech store, phones, accessories, and things are going good. And there's soon to be a third one, which is a, a steel pan store, but not like any other. In this one, it's going to be selling all brands of steel pans, all brands of accessories, books, CDs, DVDs, clothing, anything steel pan related under one roof. Because for me, I felt as if I needed to go a different direction because I was done. I best I go into business. I open and close when I want. I don't answer nobody. Thing. And lo and behold, in 2018, I was now wrapping up my term as education um, secretary for the Eastern Region of Pantrin Bago. And I had resigned from the NSS, so I had resigned and no longer was teaching nobody. I was like, all right, I ain't teaching no pan. I ain't want nothing to do with anything like that. And I'm on my way out. And somebody spoke to me and they said, if you just drop it because you can't take them, you're not the person I thought you were. Because you have brought out some great students. You have traveled the world. You have done so many things through music. And that's, you're going to just leave it like that? Thought about it. Pantron Bigo election is coming up. I decided, you know what, let me run and see. I have some ideas that I could deal with in education. So I'll run for the education officer and maybe it can be implemented. And I ran and won. And I was like, when I got in there and saw the state of the organization, I said, what the hell did I do? Now, if you know me, I will go into the Bible, Matthew chapter 5. If thy right eye cause you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to go to heaven with one eye than to lose your whole self in hell. That's what the Bible said. And I know me. And politics wasn't really my game because I tell people if I get inside parliament and have control over something in the treasury, I will thief. Millions you're talking about, you know. But... We all know it, eh? I'm nothing for me to thief. Yeah. So it's time to work. And it brings me now to where Josan would have been talking about professionalism. After you reach that place, you've followed all the rules that you would have been hearing for the entire morning. As a performer, as an educator, you studied, you came to school, you did your degree, you go and get a master's, you come back. 
NSSO is a full-time job. You follow all the rules. You get into a secondary school or a primary school. You're teaching. You're just following all the rules. Doing what you're taught. And then things aren't happening according to plan. How do you deal with that? Anybody? We have been in this situation, not so? Yeah, talk to me now. I know we have in the panel discussion after you could talk now. Because let me tell you something. Some of the hurdles you would find in, in this, and I'm talking, I could talk for myself, I know. One, there is always, no matter what position you are in, there is always the powers that be. Three words I hate. The powers that be, and it ain't God we're talking about here. There's always somebody above you. And you come with your fresh ideas, and you come with your proposals, and you come with your talent, and you come with everything. Shut down. What do you do? Be quiet here today. Oh, I'm mashing cones. I you start yet? Then you have the naysayers. No matter what you do and what you come with, as always, and no, no, no. And these are like your friends and people around you. You can't just get anything right. And don't talk for the social media now. Anything you do is a bash on social media. I'll give, you an, uh, I'll give you an example in recent times with me. Um, as an education officer, I was approached by an institution. They wanted to offer CXC scholarships to steel band majors that would have... You belong to a band, you would have sat CXC. You write CXC, you didn't pass all your subjects, you barely get a full certificate. This is an opportunity for us now to collaborate, to provide scholarships now for you to go and repeat. And you do over six to eight subjects. And it's a full-time school. It's strictly Form 5. You go there, you do your CXC, and you get out. And I said, I like that idea. I said, Beverly, have you consider this? And of course, Beverly Ramsey Moore, she was like, well, yeah. And we find money and we stuff and we collaborated with private and the school and we put together a nice package and put it out there. And I am online a day and I see somebody say I use that for my friends and a nepotistic and my own people gain it. It couldn't be Silver Stars. My most troublesome player in Silver Stars just got seven CXC subjects after being expelled from school four months before CXC. So when I say who I'm giving it to, because I, I barely know any of the children that got accepted. But they come and they attack. And it brings me to something. If you know the history of the Panama Canal, I'm going good. The history of the Panama Canal. When that was being built, it was one of the most bacchanal times in, 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 in that era where the then government would have been getting a lot of attack for it. It was expensive. It was time-consuming. And everybody had an issue with it. And the then leader of government said absolutely nothing. And everybody like, why he respond? Have mouth, will talk. Respond, say something. Not everything needs a response. And today, the Panama Canal is the biggest cash cow in Panama. And probably that whole region. And sometimes, you as professionals, what I have learned is that you just need to do what you have to do and let your work speak for you. Josan mentioned the contracts and stuff. If I am showing up to something and it's not prepared and it's not agreed on in the contract, and if you follow her rules, I'm telling you, follow, listen to what Josan said. Eh? But I have done contrary to that and still had to come back to that. She's on point. If you follow that, you, you, you provide the contract, you're not providing the service. Okay. It was nice. Thank you. I'm not even going on Facebook to bash you. I passed that stage and age. Long time I was good at it. You have to deal now with 
the professional side of you and the personal side of you. How do I maintain... Everybody know Marcus Ash as Education Officer of Antrim Bago, the same way they knew Marcus Ash was a member of the NSSO. So everybody see you walking down Charlotte Street. Well, Frederick from here. Charlotte have too much people. And they see you, and they see the NSSO, or the Pantron Bago, or the, those titles they see you as. Nobody sees Mark Loke when they see NC, NGC, they see Music Literacy Trust, those things they're seeing. Somewhere in there, they see their strap performing one of his songs. That is what they see you as even when the curtain pull. Now, for those of you all who perform, you all understand. When the very first gig I had with NSSO on Napa stage, and that curtain opened, I don't know if you all understand that feeling you just get there when you see the auditorium full. It was some days we struggled for a full one, but you see a full auditorium and you're like, and it's your turn to start a play now. When the curtain close, and you think you are a regular person once again, nobody sees that. They still see you. And that is why the conduct is needed. I got blazed recently. I got blazed recently. Imagine somebody who I know a long time. I go on Invaders Juve and I see she and thing and we dancing and thing and, and, and somebody take a picture and see a polo, don't worry. Education officer busy educating. Lord have mercy. Because we can't be a human being off this stage as well. And to a point they're kind of right. Because as a professional, you need to learn to separate yourself from yourself. And how to do it? How do we do that? Where do we do it? Last night, Josan and I was hanging out uh, on the avenue. And we were having a good time. I having some drinks and stuff. But if it's one thing anybody passed and saw us, they would have seen two friends hanging out, having a good time. You understand? It's how you do things now. You reach on a level... Past learning now, I mean, you learn every day in life, but you reach that level where you are now, somebody is depending on you to teach them. So your life now has to be that example. One of my students, mother dead, father dead, guardian dead, everybody just dead around them. They need somebody to look to. And if, Looking at me and seeing me, a party on your head, whining, across your road smoking weed, entertainers do those things, not so? So we being real. They see that, what am I teaching them? And we now, as professionals getting up, and there's my final point before I get the one minute. My final point for the younger people in here studying. You're studying right now and you're going out to the world after. You see this thing where we tend to look at each other and compare the good, better, and best? If Duvon Stewart better than Sion Gomez, them don't care who better than who. After Panorama, Sion and Duvon and me and everybody lying normal. It's always a who better than what. You we better than UTT. Because I have UE students in here too and I see it. It's always a who better than what. You we better than UTT. No. Let me explain. Dr. Mia Gormandy Benjamin is synonymous with Kelly Ramlal and UE. They both have a very beautiful smile. Come to class late. Doc class. Don't hand up your assignment as the same smile you get with a F. So this competition about who better arranger, who better soloist, who better... We need to learn now to appreciate that when Kareem solos for the NSSO, 
And a Kua solo, and, 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 and Carl and solo, Joe's and come and take a knock. We could appreciate where it is coming from each one of them without one always being better than the rest. And you see this competition thing? It really needs to stop because you ain't got, yeah, reach no way yet, and you're planning to get far with it either. I would use a quote from Liam that he told me, well, one of my students, I recorded him playing and he was beating up himself. I'll stop, I'll stop, don't worry. And I'll end with this. Liam told him, you need to be your number one fan and your biggest critic at the same time. So if you rehearse and if you practice and you know, whatever, you need to give yourself constructive criticism, but also thank yourself for being better than you were yesterday. And it is on that note, after we deal with all of this, I leave you now because I get a stop sign. But I encourage you all to continue where you're going. Develop yourself every day you learn and be more professional than you was yesterday. Be better technique-wise than you was yesterday. Thank you. Pleasant morning, everyone. Or oh, afternoon, sorry. <laughs> Let me restart. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I am Kiel Boslan Jacobs. I am a musician too for the NSSO, which is the National Seal Symphony Orchestra of Trinidad and Tobago. So today I'm going to do an overview of the NSSO and then I'll invite my beautiful fellow co-workers to, you know, elaborate on some points. Um, one thing I must mention is that um, music literacy has impacted all the members in one way or another. So we start to know. So we are the National Seal Symphony Orchestra of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we are probably one of the, or the only full-time job for a professional musician in the country other than the service orchestras. So this is a lovely picture of us on Napa stage. Right, so about the National Seal Symphony Orchestra, it was formed in December 2007 and is administered by the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts. The orchestra is headed by Mr. Lee, the artistic director, and is comprised of 26 musicians that represent the best combination of technique and literacy among steel band players in Trent and Tobago. Each player is required to audition to be a member of the orchestra. We are also required to be musically literate, um, as the orchestra really depends on reading. Not to say we do that alone, we do rote learning as well. The orchestra if exclusively utilizes the g pans or Genesis pans, which were developed at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, by a team led by Professor Baron Copeland, who is now the principal of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Camps. So this is our annual signature event. Um, Plan on a higher note concert series that usually occurs July, August. Um, we have had nine years of this concert, excluding 
2013 and this year 2019, which were, I guess was due to Carrie Festa and other major events. The Brown Bag concert series that happens in front of NALIS, which is the National Library of Trinidad and Tobago um, in Port of Spain. It happens in June, and we also have a Christmas um, session, which is occurs in December. Um, one time we went to San Fernando um, on Harris Promenade, promoting the same series, but um, it's made, mainly held in Port of Spain. And as of 2018, we have the Fusion Jazz on the Steps, which occurs on Napa Steps during the month of, well, either April or May. Right, these are our international performances thus far. Um, so Carrie Festa X, or 10, Guyana, 28, um, Credomatic International Music Festival, Costa Rica, 2010, Centenary Year of the Anime this year, Martinique 2013, Free Crop Over Celebrations, Barbados 2013, Carrie Festa in Suriname 2013, and the Ninth International Folk Festival, China 2013. So these are some functions, um, some pictures of other functions which we're going to see on the other slide. Um, so we have other engagements, of course, state functions being administered by the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts. We are required to perform at a number of state events um, at the request of the Prime Minister or any ministry that um, requests our services. We also have the contact series where we perform in our rehearsal space for schools, community groups, foreigners, um, even other cultural groups that come to Trinidad and Tobago, where we educate about the GPANs, we give demonstrations and perf performances as well. Um, and we also educate about the role and function of the orchestra, um, and generally steel pan in general. We have open rehearsals as well, where people are invited to come see us rehearse. It's not a concert, but they come to see the um, whole relationship between a conductor, the sail orchestra, how we operate, how we would go through pieces, um, and just rehearsal techniques in general. We also have neighborhood connections where we aim to perform at community spaces, um, panyards, any community space that we could go into and let the people, you know, be aware of the group and be, you know, be aware of us because they are. I don't know how that's possible, but there are lots of people that don't know we exist. Yes. Um, and we have done cultural exchanges as well with foreign groups from China. Recently, we did one in June with um, a Chinese a National Symphony Orchestra from China. Um, we did one last year as well with a Chinese group, Chile, India, and the USA. Na the United States National Symphony as well. These um, great experiences, challenging at times, in terms of how, you know, we might get a piece two days before the concert, and it's Chinese music, but you know, we adapt well, and that's where music literacy comes into play, in terms, you know, we could read, compose, transcribe, we do it as quickly as possible, and as effectively as possible. Right, what NSSO represents? First, I would say we are cultural ambassadors for music and steel pan music in general. We are also advocates for music literacy and education because without that, we wouldn't be in the jobs we have, right? Um, composing, arranging, and transcribing. Things we have to do all the time based on what is required of us. Sometimes the director will be like, for instance, so Mr. Loquan's ladies, and I said, so we want our woman in pan arrangement. I want it in a week, and we have to do it. Um, I know the captain, Mr. Brown, he transcribes a whole lot of music. Sometimes he's sleepy on work, sleeping, this. But um, you know it gets done. Sight reading. This is what we do, however, 
I think people get the misconception that, you know, we do only side trade. That's not the case. You know, we have um, what you call, you know, bringing in arrangers. Um, we have Land Bugsy Shop coming with us. And, you know, he did um, a little session with us where he did some compositions on the spot. He also um, did some old compositions that he did. And we, le we learned it by rote, but then we would also do it, you know, transcribe it to make sure that we would remember it, it would be there to remain relevant when the time is, when we need to perform it. Professionalism, camaraderie, we are a family of musicians. Um, I think that's one thing the director, the artistic director advocates. You know, we are in the group, we are a team, no matter what. No matter the issue, everybody will have issues. Right, and also steel pan advocacy and development. We are very passionate about that, not just the Genesis pans that we use, but our steel pan in general. So now I'm going to invite first the captain of the group, Mr. Kareem Brown, where we would elaborate on the points and how it affects us as a group and also how we incorporate music literacy as a main component. Hi, good afternoon, good afternoon. I mean, I'm very sleepy right now because the director had us up late last night rehearsing for the concert for Sunday. And then I had to do a class this morning from 9 a.m. to 12, rush across here, and then present. I still had to do some, um, teaching some youths to do some grade three. So a little bit behind the weather. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, special thanks to Mark Luquan. Um, I was fortunate in my life to have people like Ben Jackson, um, um, Roland Riley, you know, Dennis Roberts, um, Pat Bishop, um, just to name a few, and also late in my career, um, Mark Luquan, right? Um, I'll just fast forward to Mark Luquan. Um, Mark was at that, con at that junction in my I was at the junction in my life where I was working in a bank for a couple of years and I was fed up with that. And um, I was at UWE. I went to Mr. Sharma and um, I asked him for some advice. I wanted to change my career from um, being a banker back to a musician. And um, he said, well, the NSSO is being set up and he's doing a document for that. And um, you would be perfect in this orchestration, you know. I said, all right, well, I will apply. And at the same time, I said, well, if I stop working, I wouldn't have any money. So how am I going to survive? Um, at the same time, I met Mark on Pan. We did Pan in Education 1, where we did transcribe a whole set of work for, um, for Pan. However, he had started this Music Literacy Trust program where you would have to audition right in front of a panel. Um, I think it was Pat Bishop and Liam Teague, and it was very frightening. However, um, once you complete the, the audition process, you were, then I was selected for the scholarship program, which helped me to complete studies at the University of the West Indies, where I completed my first um, well, musical degree and musical arts degree. Right, I met Clarence Morris there, and think now is fantastic. However, um, in my journey as a as a musician, music literacy was a very important part. You know, um, in success, all the way up to NSSO, I had to learn how to read music, sight read very well in Lady and Steel, because Pat will bring out a score today. You have to read it now, and play it five minutes later in a concert. So that is true, she will do that. So I was able to, to be able to educate myself along the way um, in Trinidad, I never left Trinidad, so it was through the secondary school system and also at the university level at the St. Augustine University, where after I left, after graduation, well, during 
between graduating from university, um, I got a job at the NSSO, right? Um, but I'll fast forward to when Mr. Leet took over the helm, which was about three years ago, right? And I think, I think more of a nightmare started to happen where um, under Mr. Murray, it was, I mean, I didn't do a lot of um, transcribing and arrangement, but however, in the last three, four years, it was a lot. So at the NSSO, we do a variety of number of performances. We have Pan on a Higher Note, we have the Brung Bag series, and then we have um, what we would call cultural exchanges, where um, Ms. Boslan um, Jacob had described our we are, um, collaboration with the Chinese, right? So we had collaborations with Chinese, we had the collaboration with the, what other group I guess? Chile, Chilean, um, and India. So what would happen is that they would send the music to us in their version. So some of them would be orchestral um, scores, some will be in the instruments that they would play, right? The Chilean one was um, a singer, um, Vio pa um, Para. A Violita, right, and she is a, a, a very famous um, um, musician from Chile, and she would have sent her music, audio version of the music, and also some version of transcriptions for us to transcribe. So um, we were given the task of well, Viola, the Chilean music to take it from, transcription is taking the music from the original source and rewriting it for, well, in this case, steel pans. So we had to take that music. She was originally a git she's a guitarist. So we have to rewrite the arrangement and and describe and rewrite it in a way that will sound like guitar music on pan and also vocals. And that in itself was a challenge. So again, he would give us it three days before. And um sleepless nights to try and transcribe this music, right? Um, but the collaboration was fantastic at the end. We were able to complete, it was about six pieces. Um, the other colleagues was Amrit Samru, Sule Samson, right, on that project, right? The other collaboration would have been the Chinese with the fusion strings, right? I had um, Amrit Samru and um, also Sule, you was on that too, right? Um, but what I'm trying to get at is the Chinese orchestration was different. They used their traditional instruments, um, string instruments and whatever. We had to take the opportunity to um, transpose their stuff into the steel pan music, right? Um, the arranging for pan on a higher note, right? Within that concert series, we'd have um, transcriptions, arrangements, and compositions, right? Um, with Mr. Leeds, um, he decided that he wanted to feature local music and local composers, right? And he decided to start in indoor first. So we had Colin here with composition of Beyond Boundaries. We had Ahmed Samru doing his Damlerine um, solo for pan, steel pan music and piano. And I'm um, also my composition of Tempest, which was originally a solo, um, tenor pan solo, which was um, done over for orchestral music. So we had to work on these pieces, compose these pieces from scratch within what, two weeks, three weeks, right? So I'd never done Tempest as an orchestral piece before. So I had to move it from a, a one line tenor piece to um, seven parts, including percussion, right? And um, at the same time work along with uh, Mr. Hayward's composition of Beyond Boundaries, which was a some, somewhat of a steel pan concerto, right? Where we featured um, Duvon Stewart on, on, on solo ten, tenor, also with um, some, we invited MPU, um, strings and then also Mark Brewster on piano, right? So all and it lasted for about 10, 12 minutes, right? Of of that nature. Um, afterwards, we had um, yeah. After my composition of Tempest, then I had to come along and learn Amrit Tamru's composition of Damlerine, 
dance at the Dam Lorraine or something like that. And a band solo between um, myself and Mark Brewster. Right? So you're seeing how much work it is and you understand why I'm sleepy all the time. <laughs> right? Um, and that was just for, that was just three pieces out of all the other arrangements we had to do. Arrangements, I think that year we did, um, the following year we did invite, um, we had changed it to drums and all these features where we invited with that. We had conga and all these kind of different things. So this, this time we had invited Andrew Charles to do some arrangements from the orchestra, right? So it's a lot. We had an artist in residence um, where we invited um, Len Brooks Sharp into our space. And he did his you know, miraculous thing by coming in and doing um, his own compositions. Um, and then he did some old ones too as well. I think we started around the October. We have a piece called Easy October. Uh, I mean, it wasn't easy with dealing with Booksy, but um, it was easy. But we actually named the pieces Easy October. Um, however, it wasn't Easy October. It was a whole line of music, and we took out a section of it, and we named it Easy October. Right, and that was, and then we, it was about what, six pieces at the end? We had Easy October, we had um, Diffusion. Caribbean, Fant Caribbean Fantasy was the first. Easy October, My New Life, Sharp Fusion, and then we went back and do some old ones. Tambali. Oh, and at the same time, um, we had the passing of Professor, Ken Professor Fillmore. So then we came in and we did something called One for, for, um, one for Pro. That was about that was about three hundred pieces there. Yeah. So at the end of the day, after doing the pieces by roots, I see Aisha was one of them. But we still play. At the end of the day, we are now turn wrong now. So each member in each section would have to write their part and then pass the music on to me. Where we I would now condense it and edit the parts into one one score. Right? Um I believe we were able to do ninety, say seventy percent of it. I think we still have one or two outstanding scores to, to complete. Um, going, uh, so that's transcriptions, we did arrangements, we did composing, compositions, um, the arrangements. Um, in the orchestra, we have, we have uh, a lot of pieces by outside arrangers. We have um, Jet Samru um, um, arrangements. We have arrangements from Ray Holman. We have recently arrangements from Cian Gomez, right? We have arrangements from who? Uh, we have transcriptions from Liam Teague as well. We have a lot of transcriptions from Liam Teague, which is also done at a, at a, at a well, because of the fact that we could read, and that's our power, as our superpowers in, in, in NSSO. So the, <laughs> we were able to put on concerts. We like to call ourselves, according from Mr. Murray, fire, firemen or firefighters. You know, you just call a fire and be there. So you call the access to do a concert tomorrow, we'll be able to put on a two-hour concert because of the fact that we have this superpower called side reading. Right? Um, the time? No, I, I think I get he didn't pop nothing yet. I done? Oh, right. I think I always did too. <laughs> right, but um, it, there's a lot in terms of putting together the arrangement. Just recently, um, with Mark Loquan's um, concert on Sunday, we, I was given the, the charge of doing, origin, originally the charge of doing My Home and Colors again. And then it, it, all of a sudden it, it went into about 10 more pieces. To do, but however, I remember when Mark and I, when we did, um, when he did composition of um, Nostalgia, and we decided to call on Gary Gibson to transcribe the piece from steel pan music to orchestral music, right? So imagine strings strumming like a guitar and these kind of things. So now I was given the task of doing that same thing with my home, right? Where after Mark and I both do the thing in the, in the studio and they come up with this My Home composition, which was real fantastic. And um, now I have given the job now to write, not just for Pan, 
for orchestra, so I had to write for strings, I had to write for brass and woodwinds. And I was to still write, you know, percussion stuff and thing. And that was, I was, say thanks for giving me the opportunity to do that. We rehearsed it on stage and it was fantastic. I could have fought to tears after hearing the music. Um, Colors Again was originally done in uh, 2006 by um, Destra. Um, I can't remember the lyrics, I don't know who wrote the lyrics. It was done in 2006, Lydian Singers Stick It Up and did it as a choral piece. Um, at that time, John Jacob was the arranger. He used to play keyboards. So, I mean, from time to time, John used to come home by me. We would sit down upstairs, and we would just like punch out these notes for what the soprano singers singing, what the alto is doing, whatever doing, you know? And then he would write all the piano parts. So originally, we had um, parts for choir, SATB, piano, and pan, a four part part for pan. Now for this concert now we had to expand because we using we introduced the National Philharmonic Orchestra. So we had the right parts now for sing for strings, for woodwinds, brass. So now uh, when it, uh, when they do come to the concert now you'll see this big, big score of um people on stage now playing all these parts now. So it it it, it moved from just voices, piano and, and pan to additional strings, brass, and, and with winds, and all these miraculous things going on. So all this had to be done, so I kind of tired all now still. And um, yeah, it ain't done, it ain't done yet. So, and then choir. We had to write for choir, alone and, and pan. So I think I, I kind of cover all three things now, transcribing, we did, we do arranging in the orchestra, composing. And um, and well, from time to time we will we'll actually improvise and thing. But I think that is it there. A good deal. I right, thank you very much. Um, Sule Samson is next. Hello, good day, good day, good afternoon. My name is Sule Samson. I'm a musician too with the National Steel Symphony Orchestra. Uh, my um, part of the, the presentation was to speak on professionalism, coming after Josan and the thing they did a lot in terms of their, their concise press presentation. I will just add what it is as a, as a professional in the National Steel Symphony Orchestra. Just a little background by myself, though. Um, I've been with the National Steel Symphony Orchestra for the last 12 years, since its inception in 2007. Prior to that, there was a group, another national entity, the National Steel Orchestra, that I was a part of for nine years, for the entirety of its um, lifespan. So in all, I've been in public service life for um, 21 years. All right. Aside from that, I'm also a member of the Trinidad All-Stars Steel Orchestra. And I've been a member of, their, uh, of that group for 24 years. So within that time span, I would have had numerous performances, tours, and knowing exactly oh, what is expected of you as a professional musician. A thought came to my head before I came up here, talent. It's not competency, not all about it, right? And just what Josanne had up, up on, up on her um, presentation, professionalism is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. And members of the National Steel Symphony Orchestra, we have to live that every single day. Doesn't matter what the job is, when we go on a performance or on tour, whether they have grievances inside or not, according to, to Kareem, deadlines to meet. Nobody's supposed to know that we just finished this. We just recently, um, or the last time we, we, we had a rehearsal for, for, for this new score was just the night before. There's no exceptions. We must present ourselves to the highest because 
this is what we have reached to. This is the level that the National Steel Symphony Orchestra is expected to be at. Something we were discussing and before we came in, before we came across, the, the admiration and, and I should say the effect that we have on persons, young persons who come within, into, into our space and see exactly what it is we do. And sometimes I think for us, the members, we kind of forget exactly what it is we do and how well we do it. Because we do it so well, we kind of like just get immune to it and say, all right, our next performance. But to somebody else outside there, it is life changing. I remember that we had a performance for the Chilean ambassador and he was blown away. Even the group from that performing in, in, in the um, show tomorrow, the women in, in, in Pan, the kind of feedback we're getting from those students and even the male students who I'm here, you understand? They want to be a part of this, right? And the only thing that we, I, I, I have to say that is a little um, worrying is that for all these students that come in out of tertiary education um, institutions, right now the only thing that is available is the National Steel Symphony Orchestra in terms of a full-time professional career. Outside of that, you have part-time stuff or you do it on your own, become a full-time self-employed musician, all right? Going back to, in terms of how long I've been there, I think some people might say, well, what make you stay there for so long? And, and that, that is what um, brings me to my next point, purpose. The reason for which you, something is done or created. And a lot of us, I think, sometimes we go through phases in life especially if you've been in something for so long, I think you sometimes have to keep reminding yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I here? All right? Even like going to school, doing a degree, you going through that process, you're gonna have the times, why am I doing this again? You have to keep reminding yourself. The same way we have to keep reminding ourselves in the National Steel Symphony Orchestra because, especially because of the reason that we sight read so well, our playing ability is at a level that is comparable to your professional football players, something like that, you understand? We always have to keep doing that. Sometimes because of that, it may seem like it's boring because you're already at that pinnacle. We always have to keep raising the bar, creating new challenges, and that's where Mr. Leet comes in. He, in terms of guiding this institution, guiding your organization, I think he's doing a fantastic job. According to um, the Captain Jester, deadlines, that is something that, um, so I think it come like, 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 like cereal for us now, breakfast, we are accustomed to that now, all right? So we always have some kind of deadline to meet, and I think that is what is pushing us, besides the, the, the competency on the instrument and, and sight reading and stuff, we always have to keep pushing ourselves. Outside of the performance side, we have a small group of um, a committee that helps Mr. Mr. Leeds. So we're talking about something outside of just performing with the National Steel Orchestra. We have a lot of stuff. We have some five of five people, five persons, right? Well, who helps him as a kind of liaise, liaise between the ministry and the orchestra. With that um as I just spoke about the, the, the ministry, this is something in, within our own orchestra, we have to look at the protocol of how things are done. Where somebody who is self-employed may be able to go about, they didn't get this done, it's gonna do a legal matter or something like that. We have to follow protocol. That's something that in terms of working on the government institution, he may find it a little challenging to, 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 to go about it that way. A lot of us are thinking that we have to get everything done. No, no, no. This is, a, this is how it works for us. Go through the protocol, hierarchy. 
some of the other things that we have to look at is um, professionalism, punctuality, um, our deportment, how we speak, how we dress, how we talk to each other, how we talk to other persons. When, person, when, we, when we meet persons um, outside, I, I always call ourselves soft diplomats, where we are meeting officials either, either of Trinidad and Tobago or foreign countries. We should be able to articulate ourselves about the instrument, the country, the people, the culture. So I'm getting the stop sign now. So, <laughs> so any questions? We'll just take them up. Thank you so much to our presenters. We'll take questions at this time. We have time for a few questions. Don't be shy. Got it. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. In as much as there are no questions, I thought I'd just quickly talk a little bit about something that's coming up and as it will affect music. My name is Carla. Fodringham. First of all, congratulations to Mark and to all the work that's been done and to all the presenters, really wonderful. I want to just tell quickly about a application to make Port of Spain a creative city of music. Now, that application went in in June and we expect the results in November. And the real point to this is that the whole issue of music literacy and the use of the panyards, which I'm not really hearing addressed in a meaningful way, is something that I really want to think that winning a designation as a creative city of music will do wonders for Port of Spain and for opportunities to network with cities, other cities, that are part of this network. And right now, there are about 180 cities in this network, which was started in 2004. So the opportunity here presents that music literacy is really critical to us going forward. It's important also for us to think of this designation. We're never going to be sure if we'll get it. But if we do, the question then arises, how do we want to maintain and what will we be doing to ensure sustainability in terms of our very own culture? The thing to the network really is that the network strengthens cooperation with cities that are using culture. So I think Pan is ours. We talk of the music of the festival, so whether it's Carnival, whether it's Orisha, whether it's Osi, and so on. We understand ourselves as musically gifted, and now we need the enabling environment and the infrastructure to keep pushing us up. What the stakeholders have asked for, which I'll just quickly say, they want to see music zones created within Port of Spain. They'd like to pay homage and to celebrate and commemorate to those who have gone before and those who continue, like Mrs. Albino de Couto, um, a walk of fame or walks of fame that celebrate our musicians. What about the museum that's not happening yet? A music museum, a carnival museum? Look, these are all the things we've talked about for years. So I'm just alerting everyone that Port of Spain made this application. November, we don't know when, is going to be the result. And honestly, I'm hoping that everybody will be on board to be able for us to realize and really big up the culture of music that is so fundamental to the development of our people and, of course, our capital city. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I hope that our panotation presentation just a little bit later will answer some of those questions or at least guide our conversation towards some of the topics that you were talking about. So thank you so much for that. 
Any other questions for the panelists? Now I know, oh, okay, great. All right, we have one of our UTT students, Ms. Megan Tate. Good afternoon, everybody. This is directed to the NS, S, oh, sorry, my tongue is tied up, right? So, yeah, um, in terms of becoming a member of your team, right, what are the advice you will give to the upcoming students who are studying the um, bachelor's degree in music right now? Hello, good afternoon. Um, a cool lead, the artistic director and conductor. Um, simple advice, um, stick towards what your lecturer has in plan for your study. Uh, we literally look for persons who are proficient on the instruments, persons who could sight read, not just sight read, but be able to interpret scores and a certain level of discipline. Um, outside of that, once you acquire that, um, there's an application process, and then we go through an interview and an audition on a primary instrument and a secondary instrument. So if you're a tenor player, you know, you can dabble on the background pants as well. That will also give you a better footing. You're welcome. Any other questions? I do have a question. <laughs> can each of you Tell us what was one of the most challenging parts of being a professional. What is the most challenging thing in life that impacts being a professional? And if you have a short experience you can share with us. Okay, for me, firstly, it would be um, being a professional steel band musician in general. Steel band being my primary instrument. Um, I don't think the average Trinidadian citizen takes a steel panist as seriously as they would another instrument. So they'll be like, oh, you beat pan. I'm like, no, I play pan. I read music. You know, so generally, that was my struggle. Of, I, I continue to educate people about the right language um, and how, you know, try to influence their opinion on steel pan in general. I definitely could echo that. Um, but to give another example, not another example, but something else that was or is a continuous challenge for me. So I am a self-employed um, professional musician. So I'm at the point where I could hire an intern to help me when things get a little bit overwhelming. But before I had the ability to do that, um, it would get extremely, extremely, extremely difficult, especially if you are under the weather or you get sick, you still have to go out there. You're working all day. I could sit at my dining table, which is my office. I could sit at my dining table on the computer all day, not practice, and just be work, 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 without even playing a gig. So. Just that alone is a challenge because, yes, you need to take a break. And sometimes I have to tell myself, Josanne, self-care, self-care, self-care. So that is also important, too, especially for the university students. You have a lot going on, but you also have to remember to take care of yourself because if yourself isn't there, you cannot do anything. So, that's me. Okay, so I think one of my challenges would be separating myself from myself. Like, there are times, I know me, and when people say something to me, you could give me 0.5 of a second, I'm answering you. And sometimes what you say may in turn get a response. And now, for me, it's like I need to know, spend about 10 seconds, Think about what I'm going to say, put it proper, and then still decide if I'm going to answer you. 
because sometimes right now at this point in my life i don't think um i should be quick to answer people i mean i have students and stuff around sometimes i'm, I'm gonna lie i'll cough them long if i had a chance when they do certain things but again breed yes marcus you change your ways let's thank our panelists We'll have a short 10 minute break while we prepare for our next panel, Technological Advancements in Music Education. 10 minutes, thank you.